Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with him. Uh, short background is Chef Yassif uh, graduated from the University of Houston before uh, going and studying at the University of Medina in the, scholar, in, the, in the College of Hadith, after which he then pursued his master's degrees in Aqidah, after which he came to back to the United States um, and began to pursue a PhD in, from Yale University in Islamic sciences. Sheikh Yasser Qadi um, first began to teach with the Maghrib Institute in 2005, uh, his uh, trademark course, The Light of Guided Aqidah 101, after which he taught Life Upon Life, as well as many other courses with the Maghrib uh, Institute, including Precious Provisions, the Fiqh of Food and Clothing, and his most recent course is Darkness to Light, the, um, uh, which is Aqidah uh, 401. I believe, the fourth series in, in Aqidah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. I can't help but recall the famous story of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an when he began his study and when he began to go to the houses of the senior sahaba and study with them, one of his friends from the Ansar who used to be his playmate he said to him, he grunted and snorted in contempt, and he said, who do you think you are to go and study uh, knowledge when we have the likes of Ibn Mas'ud and Ubayy ibn Ka'ab and, Abd- and Abu Bakr and Umar? I mean, you're just a kid, right? Ibn Abbas was 12, 13 years old. You're just a kid. Who do you think you are to go and study with the Ashiyakh of the Quraysh? And mashallah, we have who we have. So Ibn Abbas said, فَتَرَقْتُهُ I just abandoned him and continued on my journey. So khalas, that was the end of that friendship. Now, the thing is now, uh, we cannot do this to every friend of ours. This was Ibn Abbas, and this was a different person, a different time, a different era. We need, cannot do this to every friend, but we do need to understand that some of our friends will look down or mock us, sometimes for out of ignorance and sometimes out of spite and jealousy. So out of ignorance, probably this Ansari kid, it was mainly out of ignorance in the sense that there's no malice against Ibn Abbas. There's just this feeling of, who do you think you are? Here we are playing football in the streets. Well, it wasn't football, but whatever it was. Here we are playing in the streets, and then now you want to go and study knowledge. What do you think will make you such a, you know, a, a, a resource amongst the ummah? And so he's basically pulling him back to do something that Ibn Abbas felt a passion for. So he just left him and abandoned him and moved on. There's also, of course, the human emotion of jealousy. And the wise person tries to sift and understand the two without ever accusing somebody. But nonetheless, there is a sense that you get. Is this a genuine concern that a person has, or is it out of malice or, or hasad? And also, another thing is that when people pretty much unanimously seem to have a verdict against you, that you're doing something that is foolish, that really is, is room for thought. When everybody, your closest friends, your relatives, your acquaintances, when they all think that this is not appropriate, it is time to think, because they can't, you know, generally speaking, no, not all the time, but generally speaking, they can't all be wrong. Um, Another point, of course, is istikhara. I mean, I should have mentioned this in point number one, but always pray istikhara to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Should I do something, uh, especially if it's a really big deal? So, the bottom line: when people when people try to dissuade you against a course of action, listen to what they're saying. See their source of criticism. Criticism is never going to stop. Every single criticism, you need to listen to it sincerely. And wallahi, that's very difficult. Every single criticism that you read, that you hear, let it sink into your heart. It's going to hurt. It's going to burn. But think about it. Is it true? Is, was this worthy of criticism? Did I really make a mistake? Or is this a difference of perspective and the person was being too harsh? Or is it perhaps coming out of some uh, incorrect uh, emotion or feeling, etc., etc.? But if you become immune to criticism and if you just shut off criticism... This is a big danger because you're basically, once again, walking on the path of self-destruction. When people are telling you, don't, 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 it's as if people, you're walking towards a precipice and you're going to fall down, and people are shouting to you, don't, 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 you just don't, couldn't care less, and you continue walking. Listen to every criticism with an open heart and mind. Accept some, reject some, and modify some. Sometimes criticism comes and there's an element of truth. So, for example, in your case, somebody comes and says, Akhi, how can you lead the salah when... You haven't studied Tajweed. And it hurts you because he's right. It hurts you because, you know what, he hit the nail on the head. 
How can I lead salah when I haven't studied tajweed? So you know what? I'm not going to give the khutbah until I study tajweed. And until I spent a year memorizing the rules and, and doing what I can to practice. So this was a legitimate criticism. And you needed to have, you know, conformed and taken to it and taken it to heart and then moved on with it. So um, again, I hope that's a benefit, inshaAllah ta'ala. Um, Sheikh, uh, with regards to your actual own shiuch, so um, uh, this is a two-part question. One is, to what extent is do you feel that the Al-Maghrib student is responsible, for example, that criticism that is not directed to them in particular, but they might get asked questions, for example, about a position of any particular instructor that is mentioned in any particular class, um, and the general uh, population sometimes holds the volunteers accountable for that, or um, you yourself, uh, articles that you may write, or, or any other instructor may write. A lot of times, the al maghrib students I have to are. Ammar, I know I'm the most controversial instructor, so you can just say a lot of times you're causing a lot of problems for us. So just go ahead and, and be frank about it. Um, well, well, let me... <laughs> go ahead. Well, yeah, it's so, so basically, at what point in time, uh, or what, what do you advise the students to actually, you know, to how how to actually handle these types of problems that you, I mean, in general, any and mother of instructors might cause? You mean me? Okay. Um, Maybe. I don't think any other. I don't think any other instructor causes issues. Yeah. Allah Um On a personal level, I don't expect anybody to waste his or her time defending me. The religion has more right to be defended. Allah and His Messenger uh, have more right to be discussed than somebody like myself. And therefore, if a volunteer or a person uh, is accosted with accusations of how could your one of your instructors say this or that, um, honestly, I mean, at, at a personal level, obviously, I wouldn't want somebody to waste their time defending me. Yet at the same yes, time, I understand. It, it, I don't. Sorry. It may not be just you in particular, but even al maghrib an a, a fest, for example, or a theme, or a class, or something like that. Um, so, if you are f- familiar with the response, then feel free to say it. Uh, and most of what is controversial about me, I have responded to publicly in articles and online and whatnot, uh, to the best of my knowledge. I don't think too much is controversial that I haven't responded to. So, if you're familiar with it, then say it. If you agree with it, then defend it. If you don't agree with it, feel free to, to criticize it yourself as well and then point out, yet I still believe that the benefits outweigh the negatives and nobody is perfect and this might indeed have been a mistake. Uh, and you can always say, and I always want you to say this, okay, this is a really good point. Let's me and you go to the sheikh and ask him directly. Let's me and you, I'll hold your hand right here. Bismillah, let's go. And let's go right now or if it's the class is going to come next week. Um, and by the way, every, every qabila knows this. When I'm going to teach in the class, I actually tell the Amir and the Amira, if anybody is causing problems, give him a free ticket to Al-Maghrib, compliments of Yasir Qadi. Tell him to come to class and see. And I have never had, and Ammar, you're a witness to this in New York, but I have never had a person who has criticized me and then taken a class at that invitation, come and uh, take it and then leave, accept that that criticism has been, alhamdulillah, wiped away. This has been the general rule that if anybody has been critical and they attended, that's the condition. If they haven't attended, then what can I do? I mean, we've tried our best. So if anybody is still critical, you simply say, khalas, let's go and ask them, ask the shiukh or ask the teachers or ask, uh, you know, uh, al-maghrib itself. And some of the things you should now be familiar with and, and be able to defend on your own. And I think one of the biggest simple criticisms, simple and simplistic criticisms of al-maghrib has been that it charges money. This has been an ongoing criticism for the last 10 years and with all respect to our critics, and inshallah they're sincere, where have they gotten in their knowledge with all the criticism versus where have our own Al-Maghrib students gotten, gotten uh, you know, as they have paid? And again, the response is very simple. Yaqe. Once upon a time, the Muslim Ummah paid and took care of its scholars through endowments on uqaf. And therefore, the Ummah would not directly pay for the knowledge because they would indirectly pay by the government, by the uqaf. When somebody died, he'd leave a large piece of land to the teachers of this school, for example. And this is something nobody with even a bit of knowledge of Islamic history will ever doubt or deny. Scholars were always taken care of by the communities, directly or indirectly. 
And very few were the scholars, very few. And there's no question that those were the elite, Ibn Taymiyyah, and Nawi, and others, who refused to take any such stipend. And wallahi, we wish we could be like that. But if I didn't teach for al-Maghrib as much as I do, believe me, I'd be go- working full-time for my university, for my other places, and I'm not going to be traveling uh, for al-Maghrib. So it's the fact of the matter is we need to balance out. I, I can t- tell you, and everybody can tell you, nobody is getting rich off of al-Maghrib. Alhamdulillah, we're getting what I think is a reasonable salary. It's nothing close to what I would be making if I were a chemical engineer, if I were, if I were full-time in, you know, in, in, in the world that I, academia or whatnot. It's nothing like that. But at the same time, we do, we do get a little bit of a stipend. The uh, headquarters, the offices, the taxes, the attorneys, the lawyers, it, to run a corporation costs a lot of money. And nobody is rolling or swimming around in money uh, through Al-Maghrib. This is something that I can swear to Allah by, and every one of us knows this, that we are not getting rich off of Al-Maghrib. We're simply earning a living and getting by, and we're helping out a lot of people in our offices and uh, the instructors uh, to dedicate more time to the Ummah. And this is something our, ta- our, our accounts are public and our uh, tax uh, records are also public, and this is something they can all uh, see for themselves. And by the way, the number one expense is typically classes. Classrooms sometimes cost us some. Mario, you're the guiltiest of all living in New York, man. It's probably about $25,000, $35,000 for a classroom sometimes, you know. New York, New Jersey is the most expensive. Uh, actually, I take that back. London is the most expensive. But anyway, so our number one expense is always classrooms. And it is the classrooms that really provide the al-Maghrib experience. If we were to go to the basement of a masjid, if we were to, you know, go to a place that is sub, uh, you know, professional, it's really sad, but that's the case of most basements and masjids. It's just not going to have the classroom experience that al-Maghrib wants. So, basic criticism like that you should be familiar with. More advanced criticism, you don't have to agree with everything. You're free to disagree. And, I've, and I'm really happy when I come across a student who says, Sheikh, I very strongly disagreed with such and such an issue, but I, I overall you know, uh, uh, agree with what you're doing and I'd like to take your class or whatever. I, I don't want students to be blind copiers or blind followers. So if you disagree with something, don't feel compelled to, to defend it. If you disagree with a stance or an article that I wrote or something, tafadl, go ahead and say, you know what, I personally disagree, but when it comes to aqeedah and iman and tawheed and shirk and kufr, alhamdulillah, we have no problems at all with what he's te- is teaching. And by the way, to this day, I mean, alhamdulillah, my, my teaching record is public. None of the scholars of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah can ever take a look at what I teach in terms of tawheed and in terms of shirk and in terms of kufr and in terms of sunnah and bid'ah and in terms of usul and, and say that this is incorrect. And I challenge anybody to do this, alhamdulillah. Uh, we are definitely sticking to uh, the orthodox tradition of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. Walillah, alhamdulillah. khair, Sheikh. How about from there, um, when a student recognizes the limitations of his teacher and moves towards more independent thought. Yet we all know that orthodox discourse seems to caution against this. Uh, Sheikh, you, you continuously talk about a bleeding edge and, and new uh, ijtihad and, and things of that nature. What type of, of thought process is required for, for these types of steps to be taken? This this question is a very profound question, and like I wrote in my latest blog article on Muslim Matters, which was my response to the response of the New York Times article, the double response, um, it's a very awkward position that we find ourselves in, but in particular myself, but just all of us find ourselves in, in that have, having studied, alhamdulillah, you know, to the level that we have, whatever that might be, and then coming here and seeing the reality, there's no question that we're trying to fine-tune that theory to the reality of North America. And that's really a vicious cycle of Catch-22. Because our da'wah is based upon salafan wa khalafan. It's based upon taking from the past and passing down to the future. And that's what we've been taught. And that's what we thought was happening from century to century. Now, I'm coming along and I'm saying, you know, actually that never quite happened as simplistically as we assumed. And, for example, Imam al-Shawkani and his understanding of fiqh and Islam was not the same as that of, uh, let's say, Siddiq Hassan Khan in India. And neither of these two was the exact same as Muhammad al-Wahhab in Arabia. And these three were actually very different from Ibn Taymiyyah ibn al-Qayyim in Damascus of the 7th century. And these five were very different from, and so you get my point. 
You know, and when you actually study it um, in a more academic manner, you do see slight variations, understanding, differences, especially in terms of conduct, especially in terms of status quo, especially in terms of, of, of political maneuvers and alliances, right? So Shokani is living when there are British people in, in the port of, of Aden, right? They, you know, Shokani is not some medieval scholar. Shokani is only 200 years old, 1830-something he died, right? So Shokani is interacting with Europeans. You know, you cannot compare Shokani to Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah is interacting with the Mongols. And Shokani did not view the Europeans the way that Ibn Taymiyyah viewed the Mongols because there was a, a difference between them. So my point being that when you study and you contextualize and you read and you gain a certain level of knowledge, then you really do begin to see that, okay, we do need to start fine-tuning here. I have said in my latest article that I understand the tensions this will raise. I understand the problems this will cause. Here you have Yasir Qadi, Walid Bisuni, Yasir Burjas, and others of their level. They are not jahil, they are not alim, they're in the middle. And they seem to be not exactly on the same wavelength as the very teachers they're always praising and glorifying. Sheikh ibn Uthaymin and Sheikh ibn Baz and Sheikh al-Albani and others. You know, they seem to be praising them and tears come into their eyes when they think about them and they become all humble and modest when they mention their names, all in reverence is there. But when it comes to the actual fiqh, actual fatawa, when it comes to issues, it doesn't seem as if they're you know, Samirna wa Ata'na. I understand. All I can say is if you want to be a muqallid, well then you choose who you want to make taqlid to, and if you choose a higher authority, I fully understand. And wallahi, I cannot criticize you. And alhamdulillah, tafadl. Uh, but if you want to rationalize a little bit, think a little bit, listen to what we have to say. And in particular, it is myself who is primarily, you know, doing these types of things and for better or for worse. But listen to what we're saying. See where we're coming from. See why I'm saying what I'm saying. And then see that whether you think this makes sense. And my point is very simple, and that is a lot of what we thought was set in stone was actually not set in stone. And the classic example of this is how you treat people of other groups. So how Imam Ahmed treated people of other theologies is very different than how Ibn Taymiyyah treated his own opponents of his time who were upon the same theology that Imam Ahmed's opponents were. In other words... Uh, the term that I call theological cousins, uh, the way Imam Ahmed did it was very different than the way Ibn Taymiyyah ibn Qayyim did it. And the way those two did it is actually even very different than how Ibn Kathir did it. And Ibn Kathir was simply one generation after Ibn Taymiyyah. So when you look at this, you realize that, you know what, the treatment and the cooperation and the alliances that you form with other groups, this varies from time to time and place to place. Then beyond this as well, what I'm saying is in terms of political outlook, and alliances with non-Muslims and treaties with non-Muslims, these are very sensitive issues. And they require a knowledge of one's environment and one's, uh, the pros and cons, if you like. Now, I would say that our scholars have taught us those usul. And had they been alive, I would have no doubt that Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen would have told us, as he did tell us back in the good old days for a number of issues, to go back uh, locally. But, uh, of course, those issues were much more innocent uh, moon sighting and this and that. It were much more innocent things, but uh, there weren't. we didn't live in the post-9-11 world. They All three of them died before 9-11, remember. Uh, but I would say that had they been alive, they would have actually told us that you know better the situation of your land and you know best what we can and what, you, what your Muslims should and should not do. And that what we're doing is we're not changing the usul of this religion. We still have the exact same aqidah, the exact same usul al-fiqh, the exact same mustalah al-hadith. We have all of this exactly the same. What we are changing are pragmatic, realistic uh, uh, programs and methodologies of living here in North America. And that's something that uh, I would say that this is, Islam requires us to always try to adapt to our situation and circumstance to, uh, and do things that are permissible and legal to do. I understand this is cutting edge. I understand people are going to be, you know, uh, it's good, they're going to find it difficult for them to, to fully grasp. Uh, what can we do so? I mean, I firmly believe that if we were to go back to our old days, pre-9-11, the 90s version of our da'wah, I firmly believe that our da'wah would collapse, that it would not succeed, that our theology would fizzle out, and, much more important, who cares about quantity, I firmly believe we would be preaching a message that is simply not, in the end of the day, what Islam wants us to preach. And I'll end with this. There's a really famous alim, uh, by, by the name of Sheikh Abdul Aziz al-Fawzan 
good friend of ours, and well known. He knows me very well, uh, and you can ask him this if you ever meet him. Sheikh Abdul Aziz Al Fawzan, he's, rel- he's related to Sheikh Saleh Al Fawzan, so that's the big alim Sheikh Saleh. Sheikh Abdul Aziz Al Fawzan was sent to America back in the 90s, and I think he was here when 9 11 happened, and then he got, he just returned. But he was here for like uh, seven, eight years. He speaks English as well. This is in the 90s. Now, I met Sheikh Abdul Aziz, I'm talking to him about all of these issues, of all these changes that I'm undergoing. And by the way, I always do talk about these issues when I meet uh, scholars. Uh, and so Sheikh Abdul Aziz was very supportive, very encouraging. And you know, he said something very profound to me. He said, when I first came to America, I would give fatwas that I myself found that I changed by the time I left America in a few years. After having lived amongst the people and seeing the repercussions and the reality, he said, I myself changed a number of fatwa in the course of my few years in America. So I said to him, Sheikh, if this is your situation, after having simply visited America for a few years, what do you think of my situation and our situation when we know our people and our culture better than any foreign visitor who comes, with all respect to that visitor, and we understand the repercussions of you know, any fatwa, and his response to be, Sah, you're speaking the truth. Naam, you're right, Sah, that's exactly the point. And so I would say that a lot of scholars do understand that, uh, and, and this is what happened with me as well, when I went back to Medina last time, 2008, I met my uh, close teachers and scholars. Alhamdulillah, I've had a lot of teachers in Medina, and there were many fitin in Medina as well, and there were some scholars who didn't like the group that I associated with, and then those scholars didn't like the first group. So there were fitin beyond my scope. I associated with a group of scholars I found to be more academic and more usuli, and other people associated with scholars who were not, in my opinion, as academic as usuli. So when I went back and I visited those scholars, they had heard all of the rumors, and the students had come rushing to them and said, Sheikh, your student, Yasir Qadi, is doing this, he's doing that. They met me with the greatest politeness. They invited me for lunch. They had a great time with me. I went to all of their houses. And alhamdulillah, they all brought up these issues in a polite manner, not the way that the students had told them. And they asked my position. They said, why did you do these things? Why did you form this alliance and back? And et cetera, et cetera. And I explained exactly A to Z. And not one criticism ever came from them. And there was a complete understanding and support. And my point being, if I were, if I were interested in going down that route, I would find scholars for everything that I say and mention their names, but I am trying to break you away, wean you off from this attitude that we have to go back to scholars in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or Timbuktu. I love those scholars, wallahi, more than you can because I study with them. But as I said, because I love them, because I know them, because I study with them, I view them in a very different light than you do. I see their humanity, I see their weaknesses. And therefore, I'll discuss with them what I need to, but I just don't see it as beneficial to attach America to a group of scholars who have never been here, who a group of scholars who have never visited, regarding issues that are American or Western. I don't mind if you call them up and ask about a hadith being sahih or da'if. I don't mind if you you ask about uh, an abstract issue of theology. But these scholars are not going to be the resource points for uh, uh, gender interactions in North America for uh, uh, political alliances, for voting, for protesting, for writing to Congress and senators, for uh, issues of, of, of uh, uh, understanding uh, alliances, let's say, with other theological groups. They might have some usul, but when it comes down to actually applying it, I would honestly tell you, if you ask me, go to Sheikh Salah Haswawi, go to Sheikh uh, Suhaib Hazan, go to Sheikh Walid Basuni. If you're firmly qualified, come to someone like me. But... It's more practical that you go to people local rather than people uh, overseas. And that is, uh, all I can say is it's up to you to make the decision and judgment. And if you want to, alhamdulillah, if not, then there's really no sin or blame upon you if you follow uh, other scholars in this regard. And with this, I'm going to have to uh, call it uh, an evening because I have to go to the salah. And I hope that, inshallah, this was of some benefit. Wa jazakumullahu khayran wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.